Well, good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? It's good to have you here this morning. Glad you're here. I want to say thank you to um, everyone that came yesterday and helped take down the Christmas decorations. We had a good group of people and uh, actually got everything down and cleaned up in about 45 minutes. It was amazing. We didn't even have time to drink the coffee. Um, so that was great. Um, and thank you to Rudy and Drew. They took down and put up the Christmas lights and the snow machines. And then um, special thank you to Richard and my Vang who uh, cleaned up the parking lot and he brought his blower over. And so everything looks nice because of great volunteers. So thank you to all of you uh, that helped out with that. And uh, welcome this morning. If you're here for the first time, uh, we hope you'll grab one of the cards on the podiums over there and fill that out for us. And if you'll take that to the Welcome Center after the service, we have a gift we'd like to give you. And uh, we'd like to encourage everyone to use uh, those connection cards to share prayer requests with us uh, so we can be praying for you specifically throughout the week. All right. Now, a um, bunch of things to let you know about this morning. The first is tonight at six o'clock, we're going to do uh, a Portugal mission trip report. And so if you will come tonight, it's a cookie potluck. So bring your favorite cookies and we'll enjoy eating cookies together. So even if you don't really care what we did in Portugal. You can come eat cookies, but hopefully you do care uh, what we did in Portugal, and you'll get to hear about that and see some pictures. Um, the other thing I want to just remind you of is we have a children's workers training on the 14th. Um, that's coming up next Saturday. And so that is for current children's workers and also for new children's workers. One of the big things that we'll be doing, uh, the state of California now requires um, everyone to work everyone that works with children to be live scanned. And so we will have a live scan machine here on campus and be doing that throughout the day. So if you are interested in children's uh, work, we would love to have you do that. And we really could use some more workers and it is a great way uh, to serve our church. It is a great way to do evangelism as we evangelize the next generation. And so if you have any thoughts or ideas about working with children, uh, talk to Pastor Craig or come to that, that meeting, okay? Um, and then, oh, then we have the Easter Mission Project in L.A., and the dates of that are going to be uh, March 31st through April 4th. And so there is a, you can pick up a flyer at the Welcome Center. I, I forgot what I was supposed to say about it. Um, you can pick up a flyer at the Welcome Center, and this is a mission trip that we're trying to make something that entire families can be a part of. And so if you have children in school, this is during spring break, and so you would be able to go down to Bellflower. We're going to be working with Bethany Baptist Church. It's a church that was uh, started back in the 50s and um, kind of dwindled down, but now is growing again, and they could use some help. So we're going to go down and help them out. And um, do you have a date for an um, information meeting? Last Sunday of this month, there will be an information meeting. So mark those dates on your calendar, and um, don't plan spring break yet. And uh, then come to the information meeting and find out if that's something that uh, you would want to do. And it, it will be a blessing to you. It'll be a blessing to that church. And then the last thing I want to tell you about is we're, we begin tomorrow our 21 days of prayer. So it's something that we do uh, every January where we just commit uh, to praying for 21 days together. And so this is a guide. It just walks you through each day of the week, um, gives you a, a verse through which you can adore Christ, a verse um, through which you confess a verse that you give thanksgiving and then a verse to, um, that you can pray for specific things. And there's information about missions on the back. So I'd encourage you to grab one of these outside and just commit to pray for the next 21 days. And as we think about prayer, another resource that is available, uh, these books are out there. They are free. They were donated by the publisher Crossway Publishing. And this is Praying the Bible by Donald Whitney. And um, it's just a great book that will encourage you on how to use scripture to pray. And so um, we're trying, we're using scripture to pray as we do this, but then there is also this book. So th again, those books are free. They were donated by the publisher, did not cost us anything. So if you want to grab one of those, uh, they're out in the lobby. Okay. And then um, actually the last thing uh, is we want to recognize Dean and Janet, their 35th anniversary. Uh, we did this last week, but we didn't have a picture. There's the picture. So like I said, we did that last week, but somehow the picture didn't make it from the office over here. So now you've seen the picture and you can um, celebrate with them for a second week. All right. Um, now, as we begin to uh, think about worship, let me read for us from Romans chapter six. And the first song we're going to sing this morning is for God so loved. And um, it just reminds us of God's love that he has demonstrated, demonstrated through salvation. So let me read Romans chapter five, verses six through 11 to lead our hearts towards worship. 
For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Would you stand as we begin to worship?
Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is my health and salvation. Come all you hear, now to His temple. What a joy it's been to have the music team help us to focus our eyes and our hearts onto the one who is worthy of all praise, who, who bestows that sort of joy. And so uh, we're going to continue in worship as we would read God's word. If you'd like to read along, our scripture reading this morning is out of Psalm 43. Our scripture reading this morning is out of Psalm 43. 
which is a continuation in many ways of Psalm 42, which was read last week. The psalmist writes, Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we do look to you as we live as strangers and aliens in, in this fallen and sinful world. As we look around us at this world full of ungodliness and depravity where people suppress the truth and unrighteousness, where people live according to the lusts of their hearts and their debased minds. As we look around at a world that is full of deceit and lies, gossip and slander, pride and boastfulness and self-pity, rebelliousness and disobedience. And Father, as we pray in light of the world around us that acts in these ways, that is dead and trespasses and sins, we recognize that we were in the same condition. We were doing the same things in bondage and dead in our sin. And so we thank you for the grace of King Jesus who washed us and sanctified us and justified us. And now as we live as your people in the midst of this world, we grieve and we struggle. We would ask with the psalmist that you would be our refuge that you would vindicate us and defend us and deliver us as we trust in you. That we ask that you would lead us by your light and truth. That you would help us then to be salt and light. That as we live, as we leave this, this building this afternoon and go into our jobs and school and neighborhoods, that our light would shine before others so that they may see our good deeds and give glory to you, our Father. And that, that when our souls are brought low, through the weight of the depravity that we see around us, that, that you would help us to continually hope in you, continually praise you, continually to seek your glory. And so in Jesus' name, we would bring our petitions to you this morning. Father, we pray for our missionaries who seek to do that, bring your light around the world. We pray for those, our international mission boards, uh, missionaries of the Southern Baptist Convention, as they seek to reach the unreached peoples and, and places of the world. We pray that you would lead them and help them, as they, especially as they are seeking to reach these unreached deaf people groups around the world. We pray especially for those working amongst the deaf of, South, of West, West Africa, Lord, that you would work through the gospel films that they are creating and sharing, that many would come to faith in King Jesus. We also pray for the Jolly family and for Seth Graves as they minister in Spain, that you would use them to send out your light and truth, that many would come to faith, that many would praise you as true worshipers of King Jesus. And we pray, Lord, for your ministry in our own country, in our own area. We pray for our six Southern Baptist seminaries as they resume classes in the next few weeks, that you would strengthen the leadership and the faculty to help them to hold fast to the sound doctrine of Scripture, to help them to watch their life and doctrine closely as they minister to these future pastors and missionaries and church planners. Father, we pray for our fellow churches in our own area. We pray for Pastor Zach and the, our brothers and sisters at Trinity Baptist, for Pastor Mike and our brothers and sisters at Soma, that you would grow them in their hope and their joy and their faith in King Jesus as they would worship you today and go out and be salt and light in our community. Father, we, as you've taught us to pray, we pray for those you have placed and authority over us. 
And so, Father, we would pray for the members of, of the judicial system, of the Supreme Court of our nation, as well as for the court systems of our state and locally, that you would help those who would render judgments to do so with justice and equity according to truth, Lord. And we pray for those who know you to, to be able to live as salt and light, and for those who don't, Lord, to, 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 not, to no longer reject the truth, but to, to, to have their eyes open to, to the truth of King Jesus. Father, we pray for our own church. We pray for the mothers and fathers in our church, for those who struggle with little rebellious and foolish hearts. Father, as we would struggle with the selfish tendencies of our own hearts, that you would help us to hope in you, to continue to trust in you as we would seek to be faithful to not exasperate our children, but to raise them in the discipline and instruction of King Jesus. Father, we pray for the grandparents in our congregation that you would help them to continue to live as godly examples in their life and their doctrine, to, 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 to set that as light before their children and grandchildren of what it means to continually hope and trust in you sometimes even in the midst of some of the hardest trials and suffering that life brings. And Father, we do pray for those in our church that are suffering, who are facing all kinds of trials. We pray especially this morning for our brothers Glenn Such and Mel Jones and Jerry Harris, that you would help them to continually find their hope in you, our salvation and our God. So we would continue to praise you our God and our salvation, to thank you as we would praise you this morning through our singing, through our studying of your word, and through our giving of our offering. And we recognize, Lord, that you've given us all things. We thank you that you've given us life and breath and all things we have. And so we joyfully give back to you. We pray that you'd use this powerfully for your glory, both in our church and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Will you stand and continue to worship with us? and children first, second, and third grade are dismissed at the Double Doors for Adventure Club. Um, open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Um, we are coming back to our study of 1 Timothy after being in John for the month of December and just looking at who Jesus was um, during the Christmas season there. And uh, as we come back to 1 Timothy, the title of this series has been For God's Glory and the Good of the Church. And even as we sang that song, being reminded that the earth is filled with his glory and we see God's glory as we look at creation, 
Um, as we look, uh, I just think of, you know, the view we've had over the last week of the mountains uh, when you get those clear days and the sun's hitting the snow and, and just how beautiful that is and we see God's glory in that. But the primary way God has chosen to make his glory known in the earth is through the church. And as, Tim, as Paul writes this letter to Timothy, he's writing this letter so that God will be glorified. He's writing this letter to demonstrate to Timothy and to show Timothy how to lead the church well for the church's good and for God's glory. And so we see, as uh, Paul wrote this to Timothy, we see Timothy's primary task back in chapter 1, verse 3. As Paul says, I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. So that's what Paul starts out with. I'm leaving you here so that you can straighten things out and primarily tell people to stop teaching false doctrine. That, that's the thing that, that Paul is most concerned with. And Timothy could have walked into the church and said, hey, listen, Paul put me in charge, so you need to just sit down, be quiet, and do what I tell you to do. But that's not how Paul wants him to do that. And we see that in verse 5 of chapter 1. As Paul says, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And so Timothy is, is supposed to, to lead this church, but he's supposed to do it with love. He's supposed to do it with grace and with kindness. And Timothy is, is to call people to right doctrine, but he's to do it again with gentleness and kindness. And doctrine simply means right belief or correct belief about who God is. And so we don't have the luxury or the freedom to say, well, this is how God has revealed himself in Scripture, but we're going to change it a little bit. And that, that was one of the things that was happening there because abandoning right doctrine leads to shipwreck. And we see this in chapter 1, verse 19. Actually, I'll start in verse 18. It says, This charge I entrust you, Timothy, my child. So going back to this, this charge, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hermenius and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And so Paul says the importance of doctrine is that if you leave the doctrine, you make shipwreck of the faith. And he gives examples of two people in their church that they had seen abandon the faith or, or change doctrine, and, and they made a shipwreck of their faith. And we see in chapter 2, verse 5, a little bit of what he is specifically talking about is he says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man and men, the man Christ Jesus. Those are things that are vital. Those are things that are the foundation, the core of what we believe as a church. We do not get to change the fact that there is one God. We do not get to change the fact that there is one way to God and that way is Jesus Christ. And we don't get to change that Jesus is God who became man and gave himself as a ransom for us. That is what we believe as a church. That is the, that is the truth that we stand on. And if we abandon that, we stop being a church of Jesus Christ and become a church to something else. That's actually what Jesus is getting at in Revelation chapter 2 as he writes as we see those letters to the seven churches and there's that thread in there, I will remove your lampstand. And I always just thought as a, as a child growing up in church and you hear you'll remove the lampstand, I just thought, so they would have to have church in the dark? Like, I don't know what that means. But what it means is Jesus threatens to remove the lampstand. The lampstand being the light is what makes them a church. And he says, if you're going to chase other things, I'm just going to take the lampstand away. You're not a church anymore. You're not a church of Jesus Christ. You're, you're chasing something else. And so doctrine is vital in it, and it's important. And so Paul says, for God's glory and the good of the church, Timothy, you have to lead this church to write doctrine, or you have to tell people that are teaching false doctrine to stop, but you're to do it with grace and kindness for God's glory and the good of the church. And then as he makes his way through the, the letter, he talks in chapter 2 about worship, the heart and attitude is what he focuses on, not so much the style. In chapter 3, we see the qualifications of leadership. In chapter 4, Timothy tells us how to serve well. He tells Timothy, this is how you be a good servant of Jesus Christ. 
But he also tells Timothy in verse 11 to command and teach these things. So he says, this is how you serve well, Timothy, but these are the things that you're to command and to teach. And so there's this expectation that the church will follow in this. Overall, this is a very practical letter. It's designed to instruct Timothy on how to lead the church well. And today we come to chapter 5, and the primary issue through chapter 5 and through the first two verses of chapter 6 is caring for one another. For God's glory and the good of the church, we need to care well for one another. And we're going to look just at verses uh, 1 through 16 this morning and be looking primarily at how he tells the church to care for widows. So if you would, look at chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 16. Paul writes, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has a children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness in their own household and to make some return to their and make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband. And having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children and has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, And not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. This is God's perfect and holy word for us this morning. Let's pray. God, we pray that as we look at your word, we would grow in our love for you and we would grow in our love for one another, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. So I said that this, uh, today and and next week, we're gonna talk about caring for one another. So this morning, we're gonna talk about practicing care for widows and then he's gonna talk about practicing care for elders and then he's going to talk about practicing uh, care for your boss. Um, In their context, they say master, but... Um, in our context, our bosses. So it's, it's going to be an interesting couple weeks. But he starts off in verses one and two and really gives us the attitude with which we're to care for one another, the, the attitude that we're to have as a church as we engage one another. How is Timothy to view people in the church? He's to view them as family. He's to view older men as fathers He's to view younger men as brothers. He's to view women that are older than him as mothers. He's to view women that are younger than him as sisters. And we don't do this much in California, but if you go to a lot of other places in the world and you go to a church, they'll refer to one another as brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. And And, um, I've always found that strange because I grew up in California and we never did that. But... I've come to appreciate it because it is the attitude that we should have in the church where when we come together, we see everyone as our brother or sister in Christ. And that's really what Paul is getting at here. This is what he has in mind is that the church is a family. And we think, well, what would the ideal family be? What would your relationship be ideally to a father and mother, to a brother and sister? And in Christ, in the church, we should be striving to teach or to treat each other that way. Um, And this family relationship doesn't change. He says here, he says, do not rebuke an older man, but but this family relationship doesn't change the initial charge that Paul gave to Timothy back in chapter one, verse three. He's still supposed to lead. He's still still supposed to set things in order. He's to um, 
tell them to quit ta- teaching false doctrine, but he's to do it again, thinking back to chapter 5, with the aim of the charge that is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. That's how Timothy is to lead. That's how Timmy's, Timothy is supposed to teach, to, to treat one another in the church. This is how we should treat one another. Now, the ESV here says, do not rebuke. And if we look at some other translations, we get a better idea of what exactly Paul is saying here because he's not saying, hey, you can't, Timothy, I want you to lead this church. I want you to charge people to quit teaching false doctrine, but you can't ever rebuke them. Well, those things kind of contradict each other. So what is Paul getting at here? The New American Standard says, do not sharply rebuke, but rather appeal to him. NIV says, do not rebuke harshly. The New Living Translation says, never speak harshly, but appeal respectfully. The Amplified Version says, do not sharply censor or rebuke, but entreat and plead. When he says, do not rebuke, he's not saying you never correct, warn people in the church. He says, you do it, but you do it with grace and compassion and kindness and humility. How do you correct? To older men, Timothy is to go to them as he would a father. And I don't know if you've had to do this, but there are times where as an adult child, you have to go to your parents and say, you know, that something needs to be corrected here. And, and it's hard and it's weird <laughs> But I can't go to my dad and say, listen, you need to stop X, Y, and Z or else. That's just not how you, how you go to your father. I can't send him to his room to think about it, <laughs> right? Go there and there and think about it till you know that I'm right. You, just, you can't do that with your parents. And so, so how do you go? You go and you, you plead with them and you, and you humbly, you, you call them and you, you ask and you try to lead them to that. But it's done with, again, humility and grace and kindness because you care for your parents. And it's the same thing um, is true with your mother. Is you, you make those pleas to them. And in the church, we should have that attitude. You want, and, and what, and the, and again, going back to chapter one, verse five, the goal and the aim is love, Right? As I think about my parents, I have this, I have a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith towards them. I want what's best for them. And so I say to my dad, Dad, please go to the doctor. I, and I, 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 I'm assuming my parents aren't going to watch this one, but so there was a time my sister called me one day and she's like, you need to talk to dad. Well, my sister's 13 years younger than me, and she just went to dad and was like, you need to go to the doctor. And he was like, and my dad just doesn't respond well to that. So she's like, you need to talk to him. You're his son. And so I just called him. I'm just like, dad, what's going on? You know, so we talk, and I just said, dad, you know, I I know you don't want to go, but you know what? For my sake and and for um, Amanda's sake, my sister, for 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 your wife, for my mom, I said, would you go? It would just make us feel so much better. And he was like, okay. And it was just, that that's how you deal with your parents, right? And in thinking, of, and I know there's always hypotheticals, but in the context of the church, that's how we want to handle one another. We want to deal with one another in that kindness. When it comes to those that are younger than you, you treat them like brothers and sisters in the Lord. And um, if you're not sure whether someone's younger or older than you, I wouldn't ask, I would just guess. And you, you go with that. Um, when we think about you know, treating one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Again, it's not the immaturity of elementary school where you're like, you know, stop touching me. No, it's, it's, the, it's the maturity that comes when, when you're grown and you care for one another and, and you want what is best for one another. And so you pray for one another and help one another and, and want to encourage one another. That's the picture that Paul has in mind here. As he uses this illustration in, in verses one and two, this picture of the family that genuinely cares for one another with a sincere heart, a good conscience, and a a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. That's how Timothy is is saying that he should lead the church. Well, let's look at, but but he is still, it says, do not rebuke, but there, we know from chapter one, there are still those times where you have to say, hey, correction needs to happen here. How does that, what does that look like? 
Let's look at two examples really quickly, one from Jesus and one from Paul. So flip over to Matthew 18. And Jesus is speaking here, and he is talking about what to do if your brother sins against you. And this is what he says in chapter 18, verse 15. And I'm not going to read the whole passage, um, but just verse 15. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. And so he says, if, if your brother sins against you, and he's talking in the context of the church, if someone in the church sins against you, go and tell them. Go and tell them. Most of the time, we have no problem telling our brothers and sisters where they've annoyed us, right? But in the church, sometimes we hold it in, and the problem with holding it in is sometimes that that holding in turns from anger and frustration to bitterness. And then bitterness turns into division. And division in a church is never good. And so when your brother sins against you, and he's using brother in the brother and sister sense here, but if someone sins against you, go tell him the fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you've gained a brother. That is always the goal, is reconciliation. Reconciliation between one another. And if it's a big sin, reconciliation between God and, and that person. You know, there, there are times where it's just like, you just kind of annoyed me and I... I took something wrong, so I just want to tell you that, and you, you reconcile, and it's good. But then there's some times where you need to go to someone and be like, you know what, I, I, I see this in your life, and that's a major sin, and you need to get right with God. But you do that with grace and compassion. The, the purpose of the confrontation isn't to inflict punishment or shame. The, the purpose of the confrontation is reconciliation, that things would be made right. And if you know Matthew 18, you know that it goes on, and it gives steps And so if they don't listen to you when you go alone, you get somebody else and and you go again and and, and you plead and you say, please stop sinning. And if they again reject you, come to the church and come to the elders and then we go. And then eventually if they still continue in that that habitual ongoing sin, eventually they, they are removed from the fellowship. They're removed from the church. And... Basically, what we do is we, we can't judge their heart. And so I've never gone, I've been in these situations a couple times, and I've never gone to someone and say, you're not a believer. But what I do is I go and I say, listen, you've been a part of our church. You've claimed that you follow, that you want to follow Christ, and, and that's your desire. But right now, you're not acting like that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm asking, I'm begging you, please Change. And in the couple cases that are at the front of my mind right now, in both cases, they've just said no. It's like, okay, well then, we can't continue to have you to be a part of our church saying this person is a follower of Christ when you're not acting like it. So we're going to remove you from membership. You're, you're not going to be a part of the church. And you are always welcome when you repent. But as long as you're living in this, in this open sin, we can't say, yes, you're going to heaven. Or are you saying I'm an unbeliever? I'm saying I don't know. I'm saying you're not acting like it right now, and my fear is that you're rejecting God, and it's really between you and him. Repent and come back. And that's... And again, you, you, we want to have that humility and grace and kindness. But sometimes in the name of grace and kindness, we are afraid to confront. And we let people drift away and fall into sin. And we need to do it, but we do it with grace and kindness. The other example I want to give you, I think, shed some more light on this. Uh, go to Galatians chapter 6. And in Galatians 6, 1, Paul comes here again, and you'll see more of what this attitude looks like. And again, my, my purpose this morning isn't so much to talk about church discipline as it is the attitude with which we care for one another. And caring for one another is sometimes saying, hey, the bridge is out. Don't drive down that road. Galatians 6, 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. 
Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so do you see the hard attitude there? Go in a spirit of gentleness to them. It says, you who are spiritual, we all get really unspiritual when we think this is applying to us. I'm not spiritual enough to go talk to that person. If you're a follower of Christ, if you have the Holy Spirit, you are spiritual enough to talk to other people in the church, to live life with them. But you do it in a spirit of gentleness. And you do it keeping watch on yourself, lest you, lest you too be tempted. And so there's, there's a humility with which we deal with one another. And then there's this underlying expectation in verse 2 that we're bearing one another's burdens. There's a willingness to walk through whatever it is with them. You don't walk up to somebody, throw a hand grenade into their life and say, yeah, good luck with that, I'm out. We're to care for one another. We're to walk through life with one another. But we're to do it with grace and compassion, with humility, with a willingness to bear one another's burdens. Here's a couple more principles to keep in mind. I'll, I'll read these pretty quickly. They all come from Romans 12. But Romans 12, 17 says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to, to do what is honorable in the sight of all. So we're to live honorably in a sinful world. We're, we're to show people what is right. In the next verse, verse 18, it says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We do everything we can to live peaceably with, with other people. And just we live in a world where we know sometimes people are, you want to reconcile and they don't. But you do all that you can to live at peace with them. And then we remember Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. We don't let the, the ugly of the world overcome us. We just keep being who we are and we live how we're supposed to be. And we pray that our desire to, to live at peace will overcome them. And we know eventually one day Christ will overcome all evil with good. And so we trust him. So if we're to live as, as family in the church. Um, when someone joins the church, there, there's an excitement to that where we, um, we're, we're always excited to get new family members. We have a new member meeting uh, this, right after uh, church today. We're going to have lunch, and so if you're interested in that, we have a couple more spots we can let you in. But a few people that are going to do this, and there's something about joining the church, becoming a part of the family. Uh, we just had Christmas, and so um, my kids are on the younger end of all the cousins. So we have all these cousins, these boys they're now bringing girls. Their girlfriends come to these Christmas events, and I don't know what to do with them. They're, they're not family, right? So it's like, oh, hi, you, you treat them nice, and you're nice to them, but I'm like, I, do we buy you a present? I don't know. <laughs> but when they get married, now they're a part of the family, and there's that, okay, you're, you're part of us. We're, we're buying you a present now. We know that you're committed to us, um, to our family, some of my nephews, I'm like, are you sure you want it? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but when they, when they come, they become a part of the family. It's like, that's really what membership is, is it's like saying, yes, uh, we're in. We want to be a part of this family that cares for one another. And so when, when someone new comes to the church and, and they join the church, we're excited about that to add to our family. And in the same way, when someone moves away, it breaks our heart when someone is suffering. We cry with them. When someone is rejoicing, we, we rejoice with them. Um, this is who we want to be. Um, so what, here's, here are two practical applications for this. Um, if you want to grow in your sense of family here at the church, and you think, well, I've, I've been here, but I don't, I don't know if it really feels like family. The best thing you can do is come a little bit early and stay a little bit late. And just talk to people. Walk up to people and say, I don't think I've met you yet. I'm and introduce yourself. And as you get to know one another, you'll grow in your, in your feeling, in your sense that this is your family. And then the second thing is just care for one another with kindness and grace, um, especially when it's hard. Especially when it's hard. And you know, our, one of the things I love about this church and I love about you guys is you do, you care for one another well. When somebody is suffering, you jump in and, and you care for one another well. So keep it up, keep doing it, and we will grow in our sense of family. So let's look at, so that's verses one and two. Um, let's look at what Paul specifically says here about caring for widows. 
Um, Paul usually gives general principles, but here he gets really pretty specific um, about how the church is to care for widows. And why does he zero in here? Why does he pick this group to say you need to be careful and, and be, um, be specific and purposeful in how you care for them? Well, it's because they, there had been an issue in this. If you go back to Acts 6, and there was some disagreement in the church about how they were caring for the widows. Were they caring for everybody um, equally? Were they doing it right? Um, in, J- in James, James makes care for widows and orphans the barometer of church health. So, so this is an important thing to Paul. It's an important thing for James is how do we care for widows? The church should always care for those that are in need, but here is a group that Paul is saying very specifically you need to, to help out. And so he says in verse 3, just honor widows. He's, so there's this, this picture that we're supposed to show love and respect and support widows. But then he says who are truly widows. And in the strict definition, a widow is someone who's a, a woman whose husband has died. But Paul here, he's going to, be, he's going to narrow it down and he's, he's going to be a little bit more specific. And he says that the, 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 these are true widows. So what is a true widow? He, he tells us here. Verse five, he says, she who is a true widow has been left all alone. So this is what Paul has in mind is someone whose husband has died and they are now just totally on their own. The church needs to care for them. There's no family there to care for her. And so he says in verse four, if she has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So he's saying, you know, if if there are children and grandchildren, they need to take care of mom. They need to take care of grandma. But for those, those women that don't have that, the church needs to step in. I have, uh, there's a responsibility and expectation. You see it again in verse eight, that family takes care of family. And I have every once in a while, somebody here at the church, again, just you guys are great and you love the church and you want to serve the church. And sometimes a senior adult will come to me and they'll say, I wish I could do more at the church. But, you know, because, um, of the, the health of my spouse, I just can't, and, and I wish I could. And I tell them every time, I say, you know what? The best thing you can do for our church is serve your spouse well. Care for them well. Because it's, it's such an encouragement to us when I see a husband caring for a wife or a wife caring for a husband. And that's what we're called to do. Don't feel bad that you're not doing more here because you're caring for your family. That is your primary responsibility. And I'll just throw it out there that if our families were better at caring for our families, the world would be a much better place. And so we in the church care for your family and don't at all feel bad about it. It, It's a huge example and a huge encouragement when I see a husband caring for his wife or a wife caring for his husband, her husband. I think I said that wrong. You know what I mean? Um, because that's what we want, right? We want marriages that where the husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gives himself for her totally and completely. And so that, that, that glorifies God. And again, going back, for, the, for God's glory and the good of the church, care for your family. Do it well. We see that expectation again down in verse 16. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened. So if, if you're a widow and you have family members, just care for one another. Take care of one another. The family is to love one another first. So a true widow is one that is left all alone. And then he says in verse 5, and she set her hope on God. So a true widow, somebody the church cares for, it's somebody that loves the Lord and has set her hope on God. And then Paul sticks this in in verse 6, that, um, but she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. That's pretty straightforward. He's like, but you know what? If, if she's self-indulgent, if she's self-centered, she's dead while she lives. Um, being self-centered, Paul's basically saying that being self-centered is a terrible way to live. And it's not consistent with being a follower of Christ. 
a widow that the church needs to look out for is that woman who is truly all alone and loves the Lord. And he gives more guidelines. Who gets on the widow's role? Verse 9 says, if she's less than 60 and a one-woman man. So she's, she's been faithful to her husband. She's um, older than 60. Verse 10, she's been a faithful follower of Christ. She does good works. She's raised up children. She's home, shown hospitality. She's washed the feet of the saints, which is the picture just of humble service. She's cared for the afflicted. I don't think this is a checklist where you have to say, hey, has she done all of these things? But it's like, is, is this the character of her life? Has she cared well for others? Is she devoted to good work? Is she thought well of as a follower of Christ? This is who the church cares for. And in verses 11 and 12, well, who, who doesn't get on? And this seems kind of harsh, but he says, but refuse to enroll younger widows. And, but let's think about the, the context. If the expectation of the widow is, is the service that he's talked about in these verses right above, if that's the expectation, then you shouldn't enroll young women who are probably going to want to get married again and therefore violate the commitment that they've made up in, in verses 9 and 10. So here, here's, here's what I think. Here's, let me explain this this way, thinking about pastoral application. Um, if a young woman has a husband, her husband dies, and, and in her grief, she commits the, you know what, I'm never going to marry again. Um, I've devote, I'm going to devote my life to the church. Um, as a pastor, I'm, I'm probably going to discourage her from, from that. I'm not going to say never, but I'm going to say, you know what, Let, let's give it a little time. You never want to make this kind of uh, commitment in, in, in grief, right? Um, some will be able to have that kind of commitment, but a lot of people won't. I mean, I, I'm a little nervous to make Sound of Music references two weeks in a row <laughs> because I don't really enjoy watching the movie that much. But that's what happened to Frau, what's her name, right? Is she, had, she had committed to be, to, the, to be a nun. She committed her life to Christ, not to Christ, but to, to the church. But then she leaves that, and she's nannying for these people because she's not sure what she wants to do. If she's really, she's now double-minded. Double, double she, she's thinking, she's having second, second thoughts. That's where I'm going with that. She's having second thoughts about whether she wants to do that, and so she goes to nanny for this, and then she falls in love with the dad, right? And the movie doesn't really tell you, but it, we presume they get married and live happily ever after. So, so the, the trap is described here in verse 12. It says, and so if they, if they make this commitment, so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Basically, he's just saying, we don't want someone, a young woman saying, listen, I want to commit my life to totally to, to the church. And then just as, as the grief kind of dissipates a little bit and, and she's still young and she falls in love and, and she has a desire to have a family again, that she somehow feels guilty for breaking the vow that she's made to God and then feels this, this condemnation and feels that she has abandoned God and, and abandoned her faith. Does that make sense? So the, the pastoral um, application, I think what Paul is saying here is he's like, that, that's why we don't just begin to treat a young woman like she's a widow right away. Is because she, in most cases, she probably won't want to stay there. And so we encourage, we encourage young widows not to make really quick decisions. So he says in verse 14, so I should, would have a younger widow. What's his advice to them? Again, you don't do this like, you know, at the funeral. But as you walk with them through that, and as you look for life or for, look forward to life, you would say, he says, I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. So he's just saying, you know, pastorally, if, if you have a young widow, just encourage her that at some point she's probably going to want to live life again and encourage her in that. So that's what a young woman is to do. And he says in verse 15, some have already strayed after Satan. So he, he's, he's seen this already. And so when you... So, that's where we're at. What, is this, what does this look like? Um, verse 16 sums up how the church is to care for widows. It says, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. And so again, the first responsibility of care lies with 
the family. And then it says, let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. And so the church is to care for those who are truly widows. Most, the most important, so, so the theme just practically, how, how does that work here? What does that look like in, in a church? How do we care for widows? And so there, there have been times where we have um, paid rent or, or paid a bill. We, we actually live in a culture and in, in a governmental system with social security and retirement, 401ks, and all of that teams. Oftentimes there is, there is financial um, stability there. But where you have a widow where, where things get shaky, that's where the church steps in. And so we, we've paid rent, we've paid bills. There have, some, there have been a couple of occasions where it's just like, you know what, this is going to happen here, but, and so, so we help with that. But I would, I would submit to you that the financial um, care is probably the least important of the care. Um, we have um, the more important care is the emotional and, and spiritual care that we would have for widows, for people that are left all alone. And I, I would include even, I'd lump widowers in there as we think about practically caring for one another. Um, again, we have, we have a benevolence fund. We have financial help that can give. We have uh, men that go and, and fix things and do that. But, it, but as a church, do we care for those that are alone? Do we care for those that don't have children and spouses anymore? We need to care for them. And I appreciate because there, there are, we have, there's a group of ladies, and our widows care really well for one another. Um, a lot of times I find out about things after the fact, like, hey, we all went out to lunch last Sunday. Um, and, and you guys do that well. But we as a church just, again, need to be thinking about that. Who in our church needs to be cared for? And if you stay early, if you come early and stay late and you say, hey, I don't think I've met you before, and you begin to hear people's stories, you'll hear wonderful stories of God's faithfulness to people. And all of a sudden, you'll start to know, hey, there's somebody that I can just care for. Just make sure I hug on a Sunday morning. Make sure I say hi to. Make sure I say, send a card to. You know, sometimes, you know, a Christmas card is great because oftentimes Christmas is, is a hard time of year when you've lost a loved one, lost a spouse. 